The band Imagine Dragons has been reduced to nothing but the butt end of a joke, and they reached this point years and years ago. As an 11 year old child, I was completely unaware of this, and in no small part because I avoided any criticisms of the band that there could possibly be. However, as time has passed, I've heard more and more justified slander of the band, and not once has it ever crossed my mind to actually analyze their albums from an objective standpoint. I just assumed that everyone else was right, and it became my music guilty pleasure. There's a certain level of insecurity involved with being a high schooler who still listens to Imagine Dragons when they know, or at least think, that it's pretty immature. So, because of that, they were banished to my private playlists and my downloaded songs on Apple Music. Now that is not to say I endorse these actions, as in retrospect, I probably should have just kept doing my thing and listening to Imagine Dragons at the same pace. But today I get my redemption, as we are going to take a look at the band's history, their discography, and the common criticisms of the band, and then after that we can decide whether or not they deserve the hate they get. Imagine Dragons started with the lead singer Dan Reynolds when he met drummer Andrew Tolman at Brigham Young University in 2008. They then met guitarist Andrew Beck, bassist Dave Lemke, and string and key player Aurora Florence to form a band. This initial group recorded an EP called Speak To Me in 2008 under the name Imagine Dragons. Speaking of which, the name is supposedly an anagram, the meaning of which is only known by the band members themselves. So in the following months, they would undergo many changes in the roster as Beck, Florence, and Lemke were all leaving. They were replaced by Wayne Sermon for guitar. Andrew Tolman's wife, Brittany Tolman, for piano slash backup vocal, and Ben McKee for bass. They grew a small local following in their town of Provo, Utah, until they relocated to Las Vegas, seeking a larger audience. The band was given an opportunity in 2009 to perform in front of a large audience due to the lead singer of Train falling ill and they made good use of the chance as the 26,000 seat crowd absolutely loved their performance. After a few more member shifts in 2011, the band got their big break. They were noticed by English producer Alex DeKid and worked with him to write for multiple famous artists and they were eventually given their own recording contract with Interscope Records as well. The release of this album they would create was led by the single It's Time, which saw massive success after being featured on an episode of Glee, the popular TV show. At the time, Magic Dragons was labeled as an alternative band and the song hit fourth on the alternative charts because of this. So the success of this single painted a pretty clear picture as to what Imagine Dragons future would look like as with the release of Night Visions the band became a household name. The album would go on to hit number two on the US charts and had a double platinum going along with it for singles Radioactive and Demons which I'm sure most of you listening have at least heard of. Not only that but it saw them getting massive awards like Grammy nominations for example Record of the Year and Best Rock Performance the latter of which they would actually go on to win which would make the band a definitive success. Smoke and Mirrors would follow up this album in 2015, hitting the overall album charts number one. However, it had no hit singles, which made critics call it a failure. However, it is undeniably a fan favorite, as many singles did chart, just not high enough to be too noticeable. Then, Evolve in 2017 was released, led by the single Believer, and this again hit number four on the US charts. This is where the band kind of transitioned to a pop style, and it charted respectively, seeing as it had monumental success on the pop charts. So to wrap up, it can be concluded that Imagine Dragons has been known over the years for taking an alternative style and bringing it into the pop mainstream, similar to bands like Foster the People or Mumford and & Sons. And the reason why they've been able to take it to such monumental numbers is because of their ease of doing it and their very palatable style. So the next thing I want to do is really go through their discography piece by piece and, and break down most of their albums and songs. And the reason I want to do this is because I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what we're talking about with the actual music itself. And of course, we're going to go from beginning to now, meaning we're starting with Night Visions. And the album starts off with Radioactive, which is obviously their biggest single of all time. Radioactive starts off the album in the most explosive way possible, and most people know the deal here. I mean, it's a rock anthem with almost yelling vocals coming from lead singer Dan Reynolds, but it's very inspiring. The reason it was so popular to begin with is because it's very palatable, like a good pop song should be, but it also was still grounded in those rock roots with those very extreme vocals and guitar melodies throughout the track. Then the next two tracks, Tiptoe and It's Time, are much more happy, upbeat tracks that are still rooted in rock, and, and the band is still definitely showing their alternative roots here, but it is much more happy and upbeat, which is a pattern that we're going to see in Night Visions and especially their future albums. Then the next track is Demons, which is obviously another one that most people know the deal with. It's another inspiring, introspective track, which still has rock roots, but it brings back the drums from Radioactive. 
which, you know, can be attributed to its success, but at the end of the day, just very inspiring, very heavy drums. And then the track On Top of the World is next, and it is probably the peak of upbeat feel goodness in the album. It is very, very happy, and it's very pop oriented, and it's a good for a younger and maybe a more wider audience. And then the next four tracks, six through 10, see the band taking a turn into much more mellow, not as like anthem tracks. The exception here obviously being Bleeding Out, which has those same inspiring drums and has a more driving chorus that is more grounded in those same roots that we were talking about earlier. And the album is wrapped up with some heavily inspiring tracks like Round and Round and The River and some more mellow tracks like America, which are again, alternative in nature. Overall, Night Visions is a good start. It's not a surprise where the success of the album came from. Obviously, as you can see, I mean, a lot of these tracks are more pop in nature but some still have those rock roots. So next up is Smoke and Mirrors. This is the longest record out of their discography with 21 songs in total. And the, this album actually marks a slight shift in style to a more soft, folky rock that is obviously still having a pop focus, but it has a few of those classic anthems that we've come to know and love. The album starts off with Shots, which is one of the singles that led up to Smoke and Mirrors, and it's an airy, echoey, kind of a slower track that features a lighter guitar than we saw in Night Visions. Uh, definitely not as in your face, it's a little subdued. And then Gold and I'm So Sorry are the next two tracks, and these are two of the few classic rock anthems on the album, and it brings back kind of that classic Imagine Dragons sound that we have known now, especially in Night Visions. These two happen to be a little different in style in the way that the instrumentals are kind of crafted, especially in gold. There's kind of this unique vocal sound in the background, which does add a new layer to these anthems. The next track is I Bet My Life, which was the lead single for the record, and it is a pretty good embodiment of the actual tone of the entire album. It's a little softer rock, but it's still keeping that anthem chorus intact. I'm gonna actually skip a few tracks all the way down to Thief, and this shows a bit of the variety in instrumentals that they aimed for on this record, I think, and it actually isn't badly executed here, and the chorus still doesn't lose its punch with this variation that the band tried to go for here. Then there's Warriors, and this track actually gained a lot of its popularity after the album's release due to its feature in the League of Legends franchise, but the track itself is another one of those few true Imagine Dragons anthems that we've come to know at this point. And this went for a very orchestral tone, and you can kind of see why the League of Legends franchise would kind of pick this track up. It's very big, it's very dramatic, and it has that kind of orchestral vibe going on in the background, which kind of makes it a, a rather unique anthem out of the ones we've seen in, in a weird way. And the same goes with Monster, which is one of the next tracks, but this actually brings back those old drums that we've seen earlier, which is actually kind of a nice touch, and it is a little bit of variation, but in general, it's kind of same old, same old. Who We Are wraps up the album with more variation this time in drum choice and drum pattern, but it actually has more of a pop synth going on in the background, which is kind of to be expected here as we see them kind of shifting into more of a pop sensibility in general here on this album. Speaking of which, overall, Smoke and Mirrors is a deviation from the style that Imagine Dragons put themselves on the map for, but it still definitely holds up to their rock anthem and, and kind of slight pop roots. Nevertheless, we see a clear difference in their style that will definitely evolve with the next record. This album is an interesting spectacle for me because it absolutely blew up and has the most attention out of any of their other albums. The first tracks on the album are Next To Me and I Don't Know Why, which are heavily stylized tracks that are much more, honestly, empty feeling than anything we've seen thus far. This is definitely them straying more into the pop area of things, which is a pattern that we're going to see in Evolve, but it's kind of empty feeling. They're not as fleshed out as some of the other songs we've seen thus far in their discography. The first really noticeable track is Whatever It Takes, and this is where we see Evolve's tone and style really come through. And what that is, is the same rock anthems, but much more synthesizer involved, much more pop sounding, and it's a lot more palatable. This is where they really transformed from still kind of an alternative band that had those kind of crazy rock inspirational tracks to now being a full-blown pop band still holding on to those anthems, you know, much more forward with the pop. Then Believer is the fourth track on the album. It is also a very clear depiction of the style the band was going for, except this time the synths are traded out for more subdued guitar, but much like Radioactive and those old singles, the drums take center stage here, which is impressive because alongside Dan Reynolds, again, very yelling, very impressive vocals, those drums make it a very inspiring and anthem-like track. So it's no surprise that this track was as popular as it was. It's a very good song for what it's trying to do. And then where Smoke and Mirrors went for more somber tone in their slower, less intense tracks, Evolve returns to the upbeat, happy tone in its slower tracks, like with Walking the Wire and I'll Make It Up To You. These are two tracks that are slower, of course, in comparison to the other tracks on the album, but they go for a much happier tone than especially Smoke and Mirrors did. And so it kind of reminds you of Night Visions a little bit, but 
once again, it's the same idea, just much more pop focused with more synthesizers and more of the more popular trends of the era. Yesterday is the most creative track we've seen on the album thus far, in my opinion, of course, almost going for a Mumford and Sons or Lumineers vibe. It also shows how pop music can be creative in the right atmosphere. And that's not to say it's anything groundbreaking. I just think it there is something to be said for this track. All right, the next track I want to talk about is Thunder. And here's where I may lose some people, but I completely and totally agree with the criticism this song faces. I think it is outright annoying for most of it. And I think at best, it's just disappointing, especially compared to some of the other tracks on this album, which actually do hold up. This is incredibly annoying. And this is not at all what we've seen from them. They're usually very good with their choruses. If you ask me, and this is the total opposite of that. I do not think this annoying track can hold a candle to any other pop song from the era even. So I definitely want to disregard this from the album, pretend it's not even here. The record closes much like how it opened with two interesting tracks with start over almost copy and pasting the pop trends for that year and dancing in the dark being a change in style that isn't unwelcomed per se it's just unexpected it has weird sliding vocals and instrumentals and very subdued vocals as well i think it's not a horrible change of pace it's just kind of a weird way to end the album if you ask me so to wrap up evolve is an interesting album in my opinion it's a very solid pop record for most of it but you definitely in context of the other imagine dragons albums can very much see where they were straying into the pop trends of the time. They kind of separated from the alternative completely here, and they kind of stepped into more synthesized and more trendy patterns in this record. But overall, it holds up. And I think this is the last record we're going to talk about because, like I said, I just wanted to get an idea of where we're at with the music all being on the same page. So the main criticisms of Imagine Dragons that people agree on is split into two categories. People either hate what the band stands for, or people hate the music. Unlike my Coldplay video though, I'm definitely going to be taking a stance that isn't necessarily as defensive of the band. Here's why I say that. In terms of people hating the music, I think they have every right to say that. See, with Coldplay, I was reading that most people's distaste of the music wasn't as warranted and didn't have a basis in a vacuum on a song-to-song -song basis. But with Imagine Dragons, each individual song gives reasons to make conclusions about the band. Imagine Dragons has their own lane, and it is a perfect example of why music is totally subjective. The things that one person loves about Night Visions will make them love all of Imagine Dragons music and that same reason will make someone else hate Night Visions and therefore hate all of Imagine Dragons music and that goes for any of the albums. It just so happens that the half of people who dislike the band are not only vocal but are a large group just so happens to be a consequence when a band gets this big. So long story short it's a totally reasonable criticism to say that their music sucks for you but where I am defending Imagine Dragons is people saying what the band stands for is bad and their place in the music world is misplaced and undeserved. While I do agree that the band has now totally put themselves in a pop realm they used to be reasonably classified as a rock band. The era's pop genre would kind of get molded around some of the culture that Imagine Dragons would create as well, so it's no surprise that they fit right into the mid-2010s trends. Them winning rock awards is a product of the band's music being on the border of both genres in the Academy happening to choose the band with the more palatable music. And also, in the Academy's defense, it is extremely popular, and it was at the time. But under the assumption they were never a rock band, that still doesn't take away from the band's music, what they were able to achieve, and the band itself. So once again, long story short, the band, while it might have had a genre midlife crisis, has a massive community of people who love the music and doesn't stand for anything inherently negative in the music world. That is why I'm able to defend the band so adamantly today. So that's about all I have to say about Imagine Dragons and defending them. Like I did in my last video, I want to plug my Twitch real quick. The link will be in the description and you're probably seeing it on screen now. I really plan on streaming more over there. So if you're interested in seeing me play some games, then I would definitely check that out. Drop a follow. I'd really appreciate that. But other than that plug, that's about it. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Let's go. Huh? Back in the mail, let's go. Uh -huh. She like I smell cologne. Yeah. I just found a deal, I'm on.